All right, guys, so today I'm gonna tell you why I bought a BMW and why I bought a 1 Series and why it's not even the 135i. So before I get into how I got this car specifically, let's talk about what my next car goals were. So I had the Integra and I had the Z, but the Integra blew its motor, right? And I got a good chunk of money out of that, even with the blown motor. So for my next car, I really wanted a Porsche, a 911 of some sort, but this didn't seem like the right time and place just yet. And it didn't fulfill some of the goals I wanted. I really want to compete at a national level in autocross. And Porsche 911s aren't competitive unless you have a new GT3 RS. And even though I finished school and I'm working full-time as an engineer, I don't make enough money to buy a GT3 RS. Even a new one. Believe it or not. But if you guys want to see GT3 RS content on this channel, make sure you hit that subscribe button. Share this with your buddies. And uh, one day, one day when I have a million subscribers, I might be able to afford a GT3 RS as well. It's a trade deal between us, guys. So with that said, I was on the hunt for cars that would be newer and could also be competitive in the stock autocross class. My goal was to use the Z as the drift and track car. That's going to see the heavy abuse. And then my next daily would also see uh, autocross use and be competitive. So what that narrowed my car choices down to were I was looking at basically last year's national winners, right, in the stock class. Because you don't have to modify the car much to be competitive in the stock class. You can do shocks, you can do brake pads, you can do a cat back exhaust, and you can do 200 tread wear tires. That's all you can do. So that makes it really easy. It makes your cost of competition a lot lower than building a car for street touring or something like that. With that said, looking at last year's national winners, I came across the E92 M3 as a choice actually. Because those were getting those are those are about in the twenty thousand dollar range. You can find some plus or minus three thousand dollars from twenty K depending on mileage and condition. So that was one option. And to add, sorry, I forgot to add, one of the criteria was to have back seats big enough to throw my dog in there so I could transport him. I wasn't gonna be able to do that with the 911. I know it has back seats, but he's a Rottweiler. He's a big dog. He's not gonna sit back there comfortably. So basically my criteria was if I could sit in the back comfortably, my Rottweiler could sit in the back comfortably. Another car I was considering was the uh, Evo 10. They're running that in D Street. Now, at Nationals, there weren't any Evo 10s in D Street, actually. But, it seems at a regional level, the guys that do run Evo 10s in D Street do really good. And I felt like I was just a slept on chassis, at least in the autocross community. I think what happens is the Evos are so heavily modified, usually, it's hard finding a stock one. So, I don't think, I think a lot of people fall into the modifying phase, and they end up getting into STU by that point. So, I felt like that was a candidate that wasn't really proven yet, but had a lot of potential because this competition would have been the new Civic Type R. So the Civic Type R has a little less weight on it, the Evo has all-wheel drive on it. So that was kind of a throw in. And then it just would have been really fun to have an all-wheel drive car, you know, something in the snow that'd be really fun to drive. And then uh, I could even do rally cross because I was planning on leaving it stock, really. So those are really my main two choices. And I was also considering a 335i and really purely leaving it as a fun daily, just because I wouldn't, they don't really have that much potential as a track car, at least not with a lot of modification. So it would have been a fun daily, fun, you know, power car. And that was, that was my third choice, the last choice. So then the dilemma comes, both cars have issues, right? E92s are known for the rod bearing issue, which is scary to me. That would have been one I'd either have to find one where the prior owner already fixed it, or I would have to save money and just do it myself, right? Because I would not want to drive around with the taking time bomb of a car. The Evo loses a little bit of clout because they're actually rust buckets. There's like no rust proofing in the car at all. They rust very easily, which is, you know, part of my criteria being here in Utah. I didn't want a car that was going to rust out. I wanted something that keep nice. Funny enough, the E92 and 3 would do better in that circumstance because a lot of the body parts are galvanized and they don't rust really. E92 M3 parts are more expensive, Evo 10 parts are cheaper, the Evo 10 doesn't have an Achilles heel to the motor really if you leave it stock. So it just kind of, it was really a big toss up of what I really wanted. On one hand, I'd get a front engine rear wheel drive car that I would be familiar with but would have higher limits. On the other hand, Evo 10 may even not have higher limits than what I'm used to, but it's a different car, it's all wheel drive. I've never experienced at a level, at a personal level at least that all-wheel drive car. I never got to really sit down and really learn the driving dynamics of one. I've driven plenty, obviously, but, you know, to me, as my own car, you can really sit down and learn the car, just like with the Integra. 
I had never owned a front-wheel drive car before, and through the last year of owning it, I really learned a lot about driving front-wheel drive and gave me a lot more techniques to learn from. So I was kind of looking at that avenue. If I did go with the Evo, that I would kind of learn all-wheel drive. But as I was looking, this car came up for sale, this 128i. And this belonged to a local competitor who I've seen set extremely fast times in sessions, sometimes fastest time of the day, in a street touring car. So not only have I seen this car dominate at a local level, I've seen this car be extremely competitive at a regional level. This car is one of, I believe it's one of few national titles, not the full big national, but other smaller nationals like the Vegas ones, the uh, Pacific Northwest ones. And it's won, and even the prior owner to the owner I bought it from has won some titles with this car as well. And so with that being said, I know the car has a history of being competitive and it can do it. So when you look at the parts list of this car, it's a no-brainer why I should have bought it. The big ones are the Bride Seat, the Bride Stradia Lomaxes. These are about $2,000 new for this spec of Lomax. Uh, the JRZ coilovers with Hyperco springs and Borschlag plates. That's a $5,000 coilover setup, maybe a little more than that. Uh, has a 1.5 weight clutch type LSD from Diffs Online. Uh, custom made. It's a uh, it's a three plate 1.5 weight with a 3090 ramp, if I remember right. And I'm actually, I'm actually gonna link down below. Two owners ago has a build thread for this car for STX. So if you guys want to see more info. You guys can read through that and get an understanding of this car, which is really cool for me as a buyer to see the history of this car. Really awesome. So those three parts I just listed out right now, the seats, coilovers, and and the uh, and the diff, or what I paid for the car pretty much. If I were to buy those, I pretty much that's what I paid for the car. Let alone all the polyurethane bushings, uh, intake headers, cat back exhaust, and the car is tuned. It made 240 at the wheels at 1,000 feet elevation, which isn't bad in a 2,900 pound car. It just came with a bunch of goodies. It has the Kose K8Rs in the car right now. And then I have a set of type uh, SSR Type Cs that came with the car. It has some sticky Yokohamas, the AO52, for the new competitive autocross tire. So I'm set there. And then a third set of wheels, a custom made set of Forge Stars for this car, because this car is so finicky about fitting wheels in it. It has such a small area for a wheel and tire that it's very it's very touchy with offsets and stuff. I think I just got a new rock chip. I drove to Salt Lake today to get uh, a couple rock chips repaired. Shout out to JW Repair. You guys should check him out. One of my friends that I drift with, a good friend of mine, and uh, he does good rock chip repair and good windshield repair. So if you guys in the northern Utah area need a windshield guy, he is your man. JW Repair. You can look him up on Facebook also. Totaled out, this car probably has about $20,000 worth of parts if you're to go buy them new. The car is completely maxed out to STX, and the only thing I really could do for STX is I could get a custom set of aluminum rotors for the car. So why a 128i? Why? Why not the 135i? Well, the 135i goes into STU. That's where the 350z was placed in class. It still is, actually. The big problem with trying to run a 135i in STU is tires. In STU, a front engine rear wheel drive car can run up to an 11 inch wide wheel with 285 tires. But in the ST classes, it has to fit under the stock fenders. The only fender modification you can make is rolling them. You're not allowed to pull the fenders. So with that said, it kicks the 135i out because the maximum you can really fit is 255s under this car. Maybe you can fit a 265 in the rear, but that's it. So, with that tire disadvantage, the 135i is not a competitive car. Now, if the 135i could fit an 11 inch wide wheel at 285s, it would be a very competitive platform. But that's not the world we live in. So, that's where the 128i comes in. It goes into STX. STX allows up to a 9 inch wheel and 265 tire. So we can run, right now we're able to run a nine inch wheel with 255s, and I believe we can squeeze a 265 in the rear. And it's kind of a, it's kind of a toss up if the 265s even work on a nine inch wide wheel, but 255 on a nine inch wide wheel is a very good setup. God, I love coffee. 
So with everything I laid out on the table, on paper, this car just makes sense. It's a competitive autocross car, built to the maximum class, and it's a newer car, and you know, it just does what I want. It has back seats. The last owner was 6'2", and he can sit there comfortably. After me sitting in there comfortably, I can sit back there comfortably. My Rottweiler can sit back there comfortably. So that checks that box off. Low mileage, 64,000 miles. Oh, I just crossed 65, wow. Lowest mileage car I've ever owned, so there's that as well. Actually, extremely reliable because it is the non-turbo version. The N52 motors don't really have many issues. They're, they're the corporate engine for this generation from BMW. So they don't really have many problems out there. There's just the common, like, the water pumps that fail. And it's more of a, it's more of a preventative thing because they're electric and they don't let you know they're gonna fail, they just do it. So I can focus on driving this car. And it's built for what I want it to. And it's been proven. So I know it works. Some other cool things about this car is, it's a 128i, the NA motor, with no sunroof and the M factory package. God, the M factory package, I would not, after experience the M package, I would not own the car without it. It's amazing. So this kind of highlights why I bought a unreliable BMW. So I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Um, I'll be doing car review of this, an actual car review, but I kind of want to give everyone an update, kind of tell everyone what's up with the car and go from there. So anyway, guys, thank you for watching and I'll see you guys next time. Oh, also quick note, if you've watched this far, if you guys want a detailed build breakdown where I go through every part of the car, let me know in the comments below and I will make that video happen. Anyway guys, catch you guys next time.